So good morning, everyone, or afternoon or evening. Um, I'm super stoked to kick off the discussions today about planet atmospheres. Um, rather than give an overview I, uh, you know, about planet spectroscopy in general, I thought this would be an awesome audience to introduce sort of the fundamentals of writing a proposal. And this might sound weird, but um, at the core of writing proposals is just target selection to figure out what accuracy in planet properties you need before doing atmospheric follow-up, um, modeling to figure out the spectral precision you can get on some planet atmosphere, and then also to figure out what atmospheric signals themselves are as a function of wavelength. And then lastly, the statistical analysis, which is how you can actually prove to a time allocation committee that a certain planet's atmosphere is in fact detectable. So all these tools are super necessary, super relevant for getting into doing atmospheric spectroscopy with of course JWST, but then also for HST or even any sort of ground-based observatory that you may be working with. And then also, super exciting, it was literally just announced this morning that JWST proposals will be due November 24th, and it's got to be real this time, it's the third time, uh, so, so let's, let's get into it. So first up in the target selection is how well do you need to know our, your planets before you go and observe them. We all know that there's this tension that exists between detection of a new planet and then atmospheric follow-up observations with either HST or JWST. We'd of course want this pipeline to be you know, seamless, but in reality, we have to get the mass first and, and, and then and only then if the target is deemed to be a good one, can we proceed with more in-depth atmospheric follow-up? And this, this naturally begs the question of to what level of precision, if any at all, do we need mass measurements to do you know, robust retrieval analyses of atmospheric properties? And I say if any, because the transmission spectrum is just, you know, the radius of the planet plus this parameter Z lambda, which increases and, and decreases based on whether or not you have high atmospheric absorption or, or not. And Z lambda is related to the radius, the gravity of the planet, the temperature, the pressure, the mean molecular weight, the concentration of all of the gases, the abundances, um, and then the gas in the cloud cross sections. And because of this gravity dependence in Z, it had been postulized that you could actually just retrieve gravity as a free parameter and then subvert time intensive radial velocity sort of altogether. The problem with this is that there are two parameters in this function that are basically degenerate with each other. And that is the, the, weight, the mean molecular weight of the atmosphere and the gravity. For gas giants, we pretty much assume that they consist of primordial hydrogen helium atmospheres and their mean molecular weights are basically 2.3-ish. Um, for, sp for small planets though, or kind of in between or anything that's kind of enhanced in metals, we just can't make that same assumption. So therefore you get these degenerate solutions like the one I'm showing here. So here are two different planet cases. One is rich in water with a low gravity, and then the other one is sparse in water with a high gravity. Uh, their spectra are observationally identical. So mass is definitely needed at some level to correctly determine what the composition of atmospheres are, but we still don't know how well uh, or if this level of precision needed varies as a function of, let's say, planet size. Um, or, or atmospheric properties, for instance. So here I'm showing the one sigma mass uncertainty for targets available on the NEXI database. And you can see that many of these targets have relatively high mass uncertainties, and even for some of the, from the gas giants, hot Jupiters, which should be relatively easy. So in order to answer these questions, you can do kind of a simple exercise, select a rough population of planets spanning the parameter space of interest, here we chose planets spanning hot Jupiters down to sub-Neptunes, all the way down to TRAPPIST-1e, which is a more temperate terrestrial planet. Uh, we also made sure to span cases that covered several different atmospheric compositions and cloud parameters so that we could track down this question of what mass precision you need under several different atmospheric scenarios. We then ran a Bayesian retrieval analysis to determine what the constraints on the atmospheric parameters were when the prior on the mass was super large, so as in the, the mass wasn't known at all, 
and then slowly increase the precision on mass until the posteriors of the atmospheric properties approached that of, of when mass was known infinitely well. And in doing so, we tracked both the accuracy and the precision of the posteriors of, uh, uh, on the atmospheric parameter. So here, temperature, metallicity, and mass uh, tracked how those degraded. So here is the first set of those results for the hot Jupiter cases, WAS-17, HAP-P1, WAS-12, HAP-P26, um, which is more of a warm sub-Neptune. So I've, I've taken some artistic liberty here to animate these posteriors. Um, the, what you see is for the, the larger gas giant planets, the retrieved precision and accuracy of the atmospheric parameters doesn't actually really depend on whether or not mass was known. Because remember, we have a good idea of what the mean molecular weight is. There was, however, the slight degeneracy between the reference radius and the mass, which you might expect as they're obviously both related through the gravity. For the case of HAP-P26, which has a slightly enhanced metallicity of around four times solar, you can see that the, which is this, uh, the, the blue curve, you can see that the, the accuracy and the precision of the mass itself was degraded compared to its one times solar metallicity counterparts. And this is foreshadowing to the fact that, that enhanced metallicity is going to be problematic in attempting to retrieve physical properties when gravity is just not known at all. So next, I'll skip to the case of GJ 1214b, which is the, the famously flat planet. Um, and it's thought to have a relatively high metallicity, high cloud deck. So this is going to sort of exemplify what happens on the other end of the spectrum. So for this case, as the precision on mass degrades, the posteriors of metallicity and temperature drastically lose both precision and accuracy. Uh, in fact, the atmospheric properties can only be inferred with a mass precision of better than 50%, but even at that level, the widths of the posterior distributions are dominated by the uncertainties in mass. So if you improve your mass to 20%, then the widths of the posteriors finally become purely dominated by just the, the spectros spectroscopy data quality alone and not the unknown mass. So ultimately, we need at least 50% masses for initial characterization, but we should really be aiming for 20% if we want the posteriors to be completely dominated by only the spectroscopic data quality. So in the tutorial that's online, I go through querying available planets from the NexSci database, and you'll see that I've grabbed only planets with masses better than about 20% precision. In addition to that, there's this extra cutoff that I did take to only take targets with a J, stellar J magnitude of less than 12. And I'm getting a bit ahead of myself because we haven't gone through instrument simulations, but I think it's important to right off the bat start developing this intuition for what precision a certain stellar magnitude gives you early on. So here are four JWST spectroscopy modes all sampled at a resolution of 100. So on the y-axis, I have the single transit spectral precision in parts per million, and on the x-axis, I have J magnitude. And for some initial context, hot Jupiters have spectral features in the hundreds-ish of ppm, meaning there's a ton of awesome science you could theoretically do in just a single web transit. Terrestrial planets, on the other hand, have spectral features in the tens of ppm. So for virtually any spectroscopy that you want to do, you're going to have to stack multiple transits to do interesting science. So at a J of 12, although this is quite arbitrary, you kind of are pushing the limit of what spectral precision you need to do hot Jupiter, or hot Jupiter science with just a single or a few transits. Uh, the other thing that, that Dr. Sharon Wang made me realize earlier this week is that several of you are going to be wondering what happens on the lower end of this magnitude scale, basically how bright you can go before your web mode saturates. So I'll have a quick slide uh, later on to show how you can check if your target has saturated any of these, any of these modes. Now we have a good idea of the target list, um, and I'll talk next about what tools you actually need to really start determining the atmospheric observability of those targets. I'm going to assume for this talk that you, that you already have a favorite target in mind. Uh, for atmospheric studies, when you're determining your science goals and hypotheses, the first thing that you have to do is decide where you sit on this 
what I'm calling hierarchy of science goal complexity. The level of complexity that you can attain in doing atmospheric science directly relates to how strong your atmospheric signal is. So remember, terrestrial planets were somewhere in this tens of ppm range, and hot Jupiters were somewhere in this hundreds, hundreds of ppm range. And this, this directly follows along with what we've seen come out of Hubble results, for instance. So for example, Julian DeWitt's atmospheric recon reconnaissance of the habitable zone uh, Trappist planets fell squarely into this, can we detect an atmosphere category? On the other hand, something like Hannah Wakeford's analysis of HAP-P26, which had a very prominent spectral feature, aimed to get really well-constrained abundances, temperatures, and, and cloud information. And, and, and the thing to realize is before any of these programs were awarded time, these groups had to first determine you know, the observability of their target, which again just relates to um, where they were falling on this hierarchy of, of science goal complexity. So the big question becomes, what is the process for doing this and what tools do you need to do this? Before we do anything, the first step is to familiarize yourself with the available observing modes, their resolutions, their wavelengths. For this talk, I'm, I'm only going to focus on the what's called the bright object time series modes or the bot spectroscopy modes, which I'm showing here colored by their resolution. The four JWST BOTS instruments cover, wave, cover wavelength regions from uh, just short of one micron with NIRAS, all the way out to 14 microns with uh, MIRI LRS at resolutions ranging from about 100 to a few thousand. Uh, from these modes, the, the very first calculation that I always do when assessing observability is to pick one observing mode from each instrument and run it through the instrument simulator Pindexo. For this exercise, I picked, I picked GJ436, and, uh, and doing this will give you a great idea of the spectral precision that you can get immediately across the entire possible wavelength region. So again, just short of one micron all the way out to 14 microns. It's also at this first initial step, this first initial run, that you can check whether or not you're saturated. So this is an example of a Pandexo output from um, for, for a target that did saturate, not GJ436. And you can see that all the saturated pixels are flagged in gray. And if you find yourself here at any point in an analysis, you should be sure to check out all of the other observing modes because each mode has a different saturation point. Um, if you've saturated in all the modes, then I would suggest go back to square one and just sadly uh, pick a new planet. Okay, cool. So let's look at this precision plot a bit more in depth. So the reference that people use for, you know, gold standard precision is the, the, the 20 to 50 ppm noise floor that was cited in Tom Green's 2016 paper. And so just from that, we can immediately see that this target is gonna have high potential for, for atmospheric success. Of course, the, the big question that still remains is what the atmospheric signal actually is. And that's gonna set the SNR. And, and, and this is where the radiative transfer models come into play. Currently, there are tons of radiative transfer tools available open source online. Uh, most of them are in Python. These tools cover everything from uh, transmission spectrogeometry to emission, spectros uh, emission spectroscopy to reflected light. Here I'm, I'm using the little present tool or present symbol to indicate if, if the tool is open source. And then the, the little running girl indicates if the tool is prepackaged with something like MC or Multinest so that it can be quickly run to retrieve atmospheric parameters. For this demo specifically, I'm working with a, a combination of Chimera and Picasso because the two of them cover all of the observing geometries from transmission to, to reflected light, but I do encourage everyone to check out all the open source tools that are available if you're interested. And if you already have a favorite, you should also re be able to reproduce the statistical analysis that I did online with any rated of transfer tool that you'd like. So starting with emission, our first calculation is the, the very simplest case. So that of cloud-free solar metallicity solar CDO. Now, the reason this helps us out a lot is if you remember our initial toy model equation for the transmission spectrum, cloud-free automatically knocks off one of these parameters so we don't have to worry about it. Then we still have to deal with this, the psi parameter, which represents the abundances, the concentrations of, of all our atmospheric gases. 
if we instead assume chemical equilibrium, we can replace this parameter with a function in itself, which is dependent on temperature, pressure, and then some elemental ratios, C to O and, and metallicity, which automatically reduces the number of parameters by a lot. And now the only thing we have left to deal with is uh, defining what the temperature pressure profile is, which we can do some, um, some black box modeling and parameterize using the, the, the planet's equilibrium temperature. So another thing to note is that these assumptions aren't just uh, to make our lives easier, although they are at some level, uh, they're also grounded in the kinds of, of planetary science questions we ultimately want to answer with Webb. So for example, we'd like to understand bulk exoplanet properties via correlations with things like mass. So this updated mass metallicity plot from Wakeford and Dalva 2020 um, shows the uh, measured metallicities of exoplanets as well as the metallicity of the solar, of solar system objects. And the dashed line is this nice correlation that the solar system planets exhibit. And all, all kind of all together, this is why metallicity is usually an atmospheric parameter of choice in both proposals, but then also in scientific analyses. So with that, we have our very first nice spectrum. I'm shading in our approximate error bars that we got from Pandexo runs in the first exercise. And you can see this looks uh, super great, but we have to check ourselves. So for any target you wanna observe, it's super important to check what data might already exist. And you can do this through the ExoMast portal. The link is in the tutorial. It's super easy to, to download transmission spectroscopy if there is some. In the case of GJ436, there is data available. And if we grab it and put it against our model, you'll see that things just don't match up at all. And herein lies the, the very first lesson. Proposals with one times solar cloud-free claims are always going to be far too optimistic, especially for something like GJ436 that's small and cooler. Um, but the size of the spectral feature does give us a nice upper limit on that original precision plot that we made. And while this is uh, progress, this range, though, is still way too large. The question becomes, how do we increase our realism from this point forward. So the very first thing you can do is go back to that original mass metallicity plot correlation and grab the corresponding metallicity given your, the mass of your planet. And if we swap out just that metallicity, it'll bring you much closer to what the data actually shows. And you can see now that even in the case where we have an enhanced model or enhanced metals, it still looks like an atmospheric detection is within possibility for this case. So going back to our hierarchical science goal complexity list, we can kind of answer this qu first question, but we're not done yet. There are still uh, two questions that we need to answer. The first is at what level of significance this detection can be made. And then the, the biggest looming scary question of all is, well, what about clouds? Uh, and I'll just add that sometimes people are so afraid of, of this question that it doesn't get addressed at all. And of course, we can, we can always create flatter spectra, so that's not helpful either. So instead, I'm going to show you kind of a nice middle ground where you can assess how much this impacts you with, without going sort of wildly overboard on the modeling side. So before we move on, I just want to stop and point out that online, in the online version of the tutorial, we'll repeat what we've done so far, but then with uh, mission spectroscopy using Picasso. But because up until this point, the procedures are virtually identical, I'm gonna just skip that part and move on to the statistical analysis just in the interest of, of time. So, whoops. Uh, so we've deemed what accuracy and planet properties we need. We've looked at some initial tools and determined the procedure for running those codes. And now finally, we can address how to actually prove observability. So returning to our first question, the first thing that you have to realize is that for transmission spectroscopy, this question of can we detect an atmosphere really just translates to can a y equals mx plus b model be rejected by the data, really? So if, if you think about planets like TRAPPIST-1 or GJ1214, this was ultimately not the case and that that model, even that simple model could not be rejected. So because doing this test is incredibly easy, it doesn't really hurt to cover a decent amount of parameter space when doing the analysis. In the tutorial, I loop through uh, three different cloud cro cross-sectional strengths, 
uh, four different metallicities. And then the last thing you'll want to do is, of course, loop through the different instruments that you've chosen, because ultimately, our ability to detect an atmosphere should depend on the observational setup we've chosen. So here are the results for that analysis, which again, ev everything, all the figures in this presentation were made through that GitHub tutorial that's online. Um, the, th this part of the analysis takes less than a minute or so to run. And like I said, not only are we proving whether or not a scenario is observable, we're also getting a sense and some intuition for what observing modes are best for doing this sort of atmospheric detection in the first place, which is great. And you can see that uh, in, in these little heat maps, Nerasos and Neri can only reject a flat line for three of these cases. And although NearCam and NearSpec are semi-comparable, NearSpec pulls ahead slightly probably because of its slightly longer wavelength coverage. So now we'd like to repeat the same exact exercise for emission spectra. The, the number one difference between emission transmission, these two analyses, are, are, are that emission spectra are, first of all, less susceptible to obscured features from clouds. And instead, the zero order effect is really going to be your choice of temperature pressure profile. The, the, major second, the second major difference is instead of rolling out a y equals mx plus b model, we're going, in, we're going to instead try and roll out a simple black body model because if the planet had features, we'd expect it to not resemble a black body. And now if everything else remains the same, um, we, we can loop through instead of cloud, the temperature, we're gonna loop through just perturbing temp the temperature, uh, the equilibrium temperature by a little bit. And then again, metallicity and, and then lastly, your observing modes. So in this case, of course, NERIS doesn't have long enough wavelength coverage to, to see emission at all from GJ436, which is relatively cool, so that's out. MIRI-LRS surprisingly suffers a bit as compared to NIRCAM and NIRSPEC, which come out nearly identical. And with that, we fully answered this first question of, of whether or not the atmosphere can be detected. And the next part of the tutorial is assessing how to detect a certain molecular feature. And this could be, for example, if you want to hone in on being able to detect methane and some spectra amongst other absorbers. Um, the simplest way to do this, which I'll again just go through super quickly in the interest of time, is to uh, remove that singular opacity contribution from each model, and that will leave you with two simple models, one with and when one without the parameter of interest. And that way you can reproduce the same statistical analysis that we did with the flat line or the black body rejection. And the very last part of this tutorial uh, is going to be trying to determine if you can actually constrain something with your planet of interest, which is, uh, which is the fun, juicy part. So there are basically three ways of doing this, and uh, the, a grid search, information content theory, retrieval analysis. And, and my rough recommendation for determining what is best for you looks something like this. If you have a large model grid that is available to you with the physical and planet properties that you're interested in, then a grid search is great. The, the benefit there is that you don't have to do any extra modeling. Uh, unfortunately, especially because the, <laughs> the, plan the planets that you'll find are so wacky, there are usually never grids that quite match the problem that you have. And so at that point, you have to ask yourself if you are worried about non-Gaussian posterior. So this could be something like a degenerate solution between mean molecular weight or gravity or uh, you know, only being able to achieve upper limits. If you are not worried about those things, then information content theory is usually the way to go. It's, it's super fast, requires very few model evaluations compared to a full MCMC retrieval analysis that requires you know, um, like tens of, uh, tens of thousands or even millions of runs. Of course, if you're, if you're worried about non-Gaussian posteriors, then a full retrieval analysis is really your only choice. The, the big con with doing retrievals, especially for, po for proposals, and, and the big reason why I tend not to start with them is that they are super slow. And this is especially annoying for proposals where we usually want to do a ton of test runs across a, a large parameter space. So because of all of this, for the tutorial, I decided to go with information content, which I hope will, will, uh, will be helpful for people. So the, the first step of IC is to compute the Jacobian. 
the Jacobian describes how sensitive your model is to slight perturbations in each state vector parameter at each wavelength. Um, the next step is to build the, the, pri the prior matrix. Uh, and I'm, I'm almost done. Thanks for the timer. Um, because the, 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 all of the information content describes your relative state of knowledge um, based, on the, based on your prior knowledge, relative to your prior knowledge. So it's super important that that gets defined. Um, and then lastly is just your error covariance matrix, which you can take directly from the Pandexer run. So we've already done that hard work. Um, and now that you have those three things, you can compute a load of different um, interesting statistics, which I go through in, in the tutorial. Um, and these statistics are really fun to kind of mix and match in a bunch of different ways to test various com combinations of observational strategies uh, until you really find what gives you the biggest bang for your buck when you're designing your proposal. And with that, I will uh, stop there and take questions. Okay, Natasha, thank you so much for a terrific talk. If people just follow your instructions, we will get 50% of the time on JWST, which uh, with so many planets and so little time, we will need it. So there are a couple of questions online that, uh, that we'll address, and you'll have a chance during the panel session to come back and discuss anything you want in a bit more detail, because I know we rushed you a bit at the end. So. One of the questions that was upvoted a lot is, could you discuss the relationship between the metallicity of a planet and the metallicity of its host star? How could we determine it and why is it important? Yeah, that, I mean, that is super, that's super important. And, and one of the things that, um, going back to that metallicity plot, let's see if I can find it real quick. Um, there is a subtlety in that plot which is the why, what is on, is this it? Yep. Um, there is a subtlety in the plot in the y axis, which is basically, is that atmospheric, you know, when we say time solar, do we mean time solar of, of the sun or do we mean time solar of the host star? And usually the y axis of this plot is time solar with regards to our own, our own sun. Um, we still don't know if there are correlation, if there are really direct correlations between metallicities of the host stars and the metallicities of the planets. So we don't have much to go on, but that is a super interesting question that we'd like to answer. Of course, it, it means that you'd have to get, um, you know, accurate metallicities of the stars as well. Okay, great. Uh, another popular question is what's the most important instrumental limitation with attempting to detect atmospheres of terrestrial planets? So the, the noise floor is going to be your first limitation. Um, you know, we've, I, I quickly threw up that, that 20, 20 to 20 to 50 per PPM noise floor. You can see just from this, uh, so that noise floor is not based on any sort of instrument, um, uh, you know, um, any sort of instrument parameters that that Webb is doing on the ground now. It's it's based on what we've seen with HST, and and so really honing in on how much we can push that PPM noise floor by stacking a bunch of transits is going to be kind of the 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 very first the, the biggest limitation in in doing Earths. Um, because you can see a lot of the targets that we have, even the brightest ones, could theoretically surpass this 20, this 20, 20 to 50 ppm noise floor. You can see that just here in, in GJ436, which I'm, I'm blanking on the magnitude, but you know, um, some of the brightest targets can certainly go well with well beyond or you know, well below this limit. Okay, and I just wanted to add one question. I mean, how does uh, PRV help in terms of defining the targets, the best targets, not just getting the mass, but we need to have a good ephemeris, particularly for eclipse measurements. Could you describe a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, one thing that you, we have to assume, well, in all these calculations, when you go to do the, the um, of course, so I'll say right off the bat, of course, getting the mass is important. For the ephemeris, one thing that you have to do in defining your observations is to define how much out of transit observing time you need. 
Um, usually it, the, the nominal thing and what I've set by default in the tutorial is just to do two times the transit duration. So if your transit duration is an hour, you, uh, you know, stick half of that transit duration ob uh, uh, observation before in transit and then after transit. If you have, if, if your precision on the ephemeris is less than 30 minutes or is not that great, then you have to increase that observational time, that, that baseline time more so that you don't miss your transit. And this is especially important for, for a mission when we, where we don't know, we don't know exactly when it's gonna transit. 